All right, so this is our lecture on meiosis. And I gave you guys the lecture outline. I'll attach it on Google Classroom for you in case you lose yours or you want to reprint it. Um, the reason why I gave you an outline for the lecture is so that to minimize or decrease the amount of writing that you needed to do. And hopefully you'll see that the headings on the outline match the headings on the slides. And then I pulled out some of the key vocabulary terms on each slide. So I'll be writing, you'll be writing, you'll add some of the things that I say, you'll also add some of the things that I write down. So we just watched the Amoeba Sisters video on mitosis, and hopefully you felt that that was familiar, and you remember some about mitosis. Now, unlike in the mitosis unit, when we looked at what was happening in each step of mitosis, we're not going to worry about what's happening during each step of meiosis. It's more about what specific cells in the body do meiosis, why do these cells need to do meiosis, and what's the outcome of meiosis, and how is it different from mitosis? And then what in the world does this all have to do with heredity and our pa passing on of our DNA? So the first heading you see on your outline, it says types of cell division. And then these three terms, binary fission, mitosis, and meiosis, are on your handout already. Okay? You don't need to write down there are three types of cell division, depending upon the type of cell. You don't need to write that down. What you're going to need to write down is an explanation of mitosis and meiosis and binary fission. Now, you should remember the difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell, right? Can somebody tell me something about a prokaryotic cell? Yes. Mm -hmm. It does not have a nucleus. Can you give me an example of a prokaryotic cell? A bacterial cell, exactly. So bacterial cells are prokaryotic, and they perform a process called binary fission. <coughs> and in binary fission, so this is where you would add to your handout, okay? In binary fission, you're taking one cell, and it's dividing, and you're going to get two genetically identical cells. Sorry, my writing is really not that messy. It's and I was paused. I don't know how long I was paused. I hate that. It pauses sometimes and I don't catch it. All right, so meiosis, that reduction division, reducing the number of chromosomes and making new cells. Sorry for the sniffles. I've got either allergies or a cold starting. So I think it's probably allergies from the horrible winds that are blowing. And we're frozen, we're frozen. There we go. Next slide, asexual versus sexual reproduction. So let's read the whole thing before we write anything, okay? Asexual reproduction literally means without <coughs> sex. Without sex. We're not talking about, you know, we're talking about in the animal kingdom, sex doesn't mean the same thing when, as we think of when we think of sex. This is without an exchange of ge genetic material, okay? Without genetic exchange. And so, in order to accomplish that, the cells literally have to, the original organism makes an identical copy of itself. Okay, that's what you'd want to write down. That asexual reproduction is, is, occurs without an exchange of any genetic material, and the end result is an organism that's just copied itself. And this is an advantage if it's hard to find a partner to exchange genetic information with, and you still have to make more of your kind. So if you're, um, there are lots of invertebrates that can do this. I mean, a starfish, if you pull off one of its arms, can grow a whole new starfish. Okay? So, um, you know, that's a defense mechanism, for example, in a starfish. But... Um, you know, bacterial cells might not be able to find a, um, a partner to exchange genetic information. So interestingly enough, though, that bacterial cells can also swap genetic information. Sexual reproduction is when genetic material from two different individuals of different sexes are combined, okay? Combining genetic material. 
And the result of sexual reproduction is it increases genetic diversity. That all organisms don't look exactly the same as each other. Which is good. Variation is good. Variety is good. Just like all the different types of Girl Scout <coughs> cookies. Variety is good. And delicious. And delicious. My life is going to be all about Girl Scout cookies for the next month. With both of my daughters selling. They've taken over my dining room. I have boxes and boxes of Girl Scout cookies at my house. I told my husband, if the house is on fire, save the cookies. And the dogs. <laughs> well, the kids have legs. They'll get out themselves. I ex hopefully. I, of course, save my children first. Okay, so why do cells divide? Why do cells divide? Do you see under that heading, you've got four little bullets, little dashes? So here's our why do cells have to divide. So in our body, if you cut yourself and you have damage to your, to your body, well, you have to repair it. How do you do that? Through mitosis. If we have cells that have died and we have to regenerate new ones, so that's how we replace them. If we want to make more, if you're an organism that can do binary fission, for example, or um, asexual reproduction, if you want to make more, you can reproduce using cell division. And then, of course, there's the process that you guys are all going through at a really, really rapid pace, which is growth. You're going through huge amounts of cell growth as you're growing and reaching your full potential. And some of you still have a couple of years left to go through that. So those are the four reasons that, that cells are going to divide, okay? Did you not get it all? I'll go back one slide. So cells are very tiny. Most of them, we, you know, we really can't see them with our naked eye. The human egg cell is the only exception in the human body. It's the largest cell in the human body, about the size of the period at the end of a sentence in 12-point font. So when cells grow, they reach a certain point where they stop growing in size. And that's the stimulus to divide. Why can a cell not get bigger and bigger and bigger forever and ever? Why do we have to be multiple numbers of cells? This is something we talked about. Yes? It puts stress on the nucleus. It puts stress on the nucleus and specifically the DNA inside of the nucleus. So a cell that gets much larger, it puts demands on the DNA inside of the nucleus. What's the other difficulty? What do cells need to live? What do you need to live? Yeah, but you're a living organism. <coughs> what? <coughs> okay, how do we get energy? Food. food. We need food. We need water. We need oxygen. Why do we need to take those things into our body? Because our individual cells need them. And so the larger you get, as far as each individual cell, the larger each individual cell becomes, the harder it is to adequately move nutrients and waste in and out of the cell. So there are two... Two little dashes there, why are cells so small? Because if a cell gets too big, it puts too much of a demand on its DNA, 
and it can't move materials efficiently through its cell membrane. Okay, ready? So what do cells need? Why, why would cells need to be able to move stuff in and out? Because cells have to have oxygen, water, and food. And they get that across the cell membrane. So the larger they are, the more nutrients they have, and they make more waste. And so they have to be able to effectively get that stuff through. So it gets it across the cell membrane. Do you remember that unit that we did with diffusion? <coughs> And osmosis. <coughs> and then we talked about uh, penocytosis, phagocytosis, and exocytosis. All of those processes are the mechanisms that cell cells use to get materials in and out. So they have to import as well as export. So larger cells need more nutrients and they make more waste. And so this is what limits the size of a cell. So these here are the, the ways that it gets into the cell. So We've established that a cell cannot keep growing, a single cell cannot just keep growing forever and ever. At some point, it's going to have to do what? Divide. And when the cell divides, okay, it's going to reduce the surface area to volume ratio. So a smaller cell becomes the ideal. That's why we're made up of cells several trillion cells. So cell division is just a process of dividing cellular and genetic material from one parent cell between two new daughter cells. So here's a nice little graphic. We have a parent cell dividing to make two daughter cells. Each daughter cell is going to have its own nucleus, same genetic material. We've gone over this a lot. They're just going to be smaller, and then they can expand in size as they go back into interphase of the cell cycle. So before a cell can divide, what has to happen? So you have to copy your DNA, and you have to have organelles and proteins so that each new cell has what it needs to survive. So over here, we have what process happening? DNA replication. We just had that in our last chapter. And in this picture, we're showing in blue the chromosomes lining up along the center of the cell and the green structures are the spindle fibers getting ready to pull the chromosomes apart so that each new daughter cell gets a full set. Isn't that like the picture of mitosis? Yes, that is a picture from mitosis. Just a, using a different dye. 
So let's talk about some, some vocabulary words that students always get confused with and um, differences between chromosomes and genes. Hopefully you guys know that chromosomes are made up of DNA and proteins. Okay, so a chromosome is a long strand of DNA, a very, very long strand of DNA wrapped around proteins, and it's super coiled up. And so down here you see the chromosome represented by this X-like structure. If you unwound that chromosome, you would get one long piece of DNA. So a chromosome is a very, so one chromosome has many genes and therefore it can carry information for making lots and lots of traits. So a gene is just a piece, so there are many genes on each chromosome. One chromosome contains many genes, even though it's one long piece of DNA. Most of the information on the DNA is actually not used. It, um, for making proteins. It's used for making enzymes and um, the other types of RNA and all of the equipment to make the process of protein synthesis occur. And so here we have something down in the bottom left should look familiar, your double-stranded helix as it's all coiled up like a telephone cord almost. And showing that it's wound up into a telomere, which is just one of the legs of a chromosome. And then you have a cell with a nucleus with a bunch of chromosomes. So hopefully you recognize that what scale were we looking at? We were looking at DNA, the double-stranded helix, and not the whole chromosome. So what is a chromosome? <coughs> What do you think of? You think of something that looks like that, that X-shaped structure. You think of that. And you're right, that's a chromosome. Purple Cheetos. Purple Cheetos. Two, well, yes, but this is a, a factory mistake because it's two purple Cheetos bonded together, right? And they're identical purple Cheetos. Okay. Grape, that would be gross. It's just purple. It's just they used purple dye instead of the orange dye to make you think it's really cheese, but which it's not. What is it? Chemicals. Wait, so Cheetos don't have Cheetos? <laughs> Read the label. It's, it's all. It's all powdered. The more processed the foods are that you're eating, the less real food you're really consuming. You're consuming things that have been created in labs. Yeah. It's corn and stuff, but it's all been processed and I bet you could find on YouTube a video of how Cheetos are made. Natural stuff. Natural. The less processed foods you eat, the better. Because the better good whole wholesome nutrition you get. So, a chromosome, you automatically think of that. But really what you're seeing here is that this is a long strand of DNA and this is the exact copy. And so we call these sister chromatids, okay? This is one chromatid and this is another. So I'm going to show you another set of pictures and I want you to draw in your notes. It will be beneficial to you to draw. So let's start off with this, a chromatid. This chromatid, this is one piece of DNA. And there it is again, but now it's attached to its copied DNA. And so now this is a pair of sister chromatids.
They're held together at this point called a centromere. So it doesn't actually cross its shape like that? Yeah. It's just like pinched in. Imagine two, you know if you're, if someone's making a balloon animal for you uh -huh. and they blow one of those long balloons up and if they tied two balloons together, that's what it would be like. Okay. <coughs> so here's the original DNA and here's the copy. And we call that thing a chromosome. When we count chromosomes in a cell, we we count how many centromeres. So here's one centromere, here's one centromere. So we would say that this chromatid is one chromosome, and this pair of sister chromatids is still one chromosome, because you only have one centromere there. This is going to be important when we start looking at the process of meiosis and trying to figure out what happened to the number of our chromosomes. If you were able to find the end of the DNA on one of these sister chromatids, and if you pulled on it and it started to unravel, you would get chromatin, which is uncoiled DNA. What do you, how do you draw that? I do it like this. And, I'm, and I make it look like spaghetti. Whereas when I draw this one, I draw it like this, and I coil it like that. And I go little squirrelies like that, and I go like that, and I go. I have to make the sounds too. See, and this one I would just go, making sure it looked really coiled up. That works, right? So, I don't know if you know your pasta. This would be like in the nucleus, a bowl of spaghetti noodles, long, 46 long noodles. And this would be like you had double rigatonis, you know? And then this would be like a single rigatoni noodle. And, it, and if you were asked to divide your noodles and make two bowls with 23 in each, it'd be so much easier to have the rigatoni, right? Than to have these long, that, that's why DNA coils up. That's my pasta example for why. Why do you have to make chromosomes? Because it's easier to sort it. That works, right? My computer doesn't work, but that works. So the centromere is the point where they're attached to each other, and then when it's uncoiled, we call that chromatin. So these words, words are crazy, aren't they? Chromatid, chromatids, plural. Chromosome, chromatin. You got to know the difference. Well, the make a uh huh. Yeah, this is what we would, the one in the center is what we would refer to as a chromosome. So, this isn't on your outline. Just remember that a cell goes through the cell cycle, and that's the series of events of the lifetime of a cell as it prepares to divide. It just does, its, just does its thing. This is on your outline. Somatic versus... Somatic cells versus gametes. All right. This is so easy to think of. Okay. Somatic cells are body cells. And they are the cells that go through mitosis. The example is every cell in your body except for eggs and sperm. Every cell in your body except for eggs and sperm. Okay, so every cell in your body except for eggs and sperm. So a heart cell, a liver cell, a bone cell, a skin cell, a hair follicle cell, a muscle cell. Those are all somatic cells. I hate this when it freezes like that. Gametes are going to be our eggs and our sperm cells. And so only our sex cells are our gametes. And they are the only cells that do meiosis. It's my meiosis. Meiosis.
I've heard some people say meiosis as well. We are not going to learn about step-by-step -step detail because it's more complicated than mitosis. And for you guys to understand the importance of it, you don't need to understand the step-by-step. -step. But we're going to learn the highlights of why it's different and why is it so important. Okay. So to get you ready to go deeper into the process of meiosis, I'm going to have you tonight do the reading guide for 11-4. I'm going to give you the handout. It's just the front side. It's not going to take you very long. But you're going to want to go through and read through 11-4. Tomorrow we'll finish up the notes. You have a quiz on 11-4 on Thursday. Okay? So in the last couple of minutes of class, Start working on this, all right? And we'll finish lecture tomorrow. This page is on 15, right? This is going to go, your notes are going to go on a right-hand page, okay, which is 15, I think. Th 13, 14, uh, 16. Notes go on 16, a right-hand page, and this reading guide handout is going to go on a left-hand page. It will be up on um, the table of contents on Google Classroom.